Hey, welcome everybody. This is the uh, Department of Anthropology at the University of Manitoba Colloquium Series. And uh, due to the current COVID pandemic situation, uh, what we've done is put a new wrinkle on our colloquium series by having a, a lecture primer before we actually get to the lecture. Uh, so just to give you a sense of the department, my name is Kent Fowler. I'm the uh, uh, chair of graduate programs and associate professor in the in the department. And uh, this colloquium series goes back quite a long way. The department was initially established in 1968, so it's easily as old as I am. Um, over the years, these 52 years, the department has become well known for its sociocultural archaeology and biological anthropology programs. And uh, being located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and being in the homeland of the Métis Nation, uh, the department has long been dedicated to community engagement uh, and research on the rich, diverse, and multifaceted ways of, of being human. And we strive every day to give those experiences that we have uh, to our students and open that way through interests in global political economy, through human rights, research on social movements, uh, food studies, applied anthropology, trying to answer questions about past food systems, why societies became big and complex and collapsed, studies of human health and disease, studies of human growth and development, and combine all of these together. Uh, now, our focus today is on archaeology. That's the lecture that we'll be having um, this coming Friday. So archaeology, I am an archaeologist, and uh, archaeologists are kind of different animals in anthropology departments, uh, largely because the training that archaeologists have is really fits within an anthropology department. On the one hand, we need special training like social cultural anthropologists in language and in uh, the, broadly the social sciences and humanities, things like you know philosophy and history. Uh, where do ideas come from? How do we incorporate and handle and understand historical records? And on the other hand, there's a requirement to have some serious training in the sciences as well, which most often in archaeology involve zoology, uh, geology, botany, and things like chemistry. So when taking all of these things and putting them together and, and delivering them to students, we end up with wonderful people like the speaker that we are going to have uh, in our upcoming talk. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Dale Simpson, Jr. He's uh, an adjunct professor and instructor at the College of DuPage, which is just west of Chicago, not too far out there. Um, uh, Dale did his PhD at Queensland, and he did his MA at Auckland, and he did his bachelor's advanced at the University of Manitoba. And so, yeah, look at that. So he's showing the colors there. Fantastic. So no, anyway, no, no black and no, no black and gold, but you know, this was uh, 20 years ago when I bought it. So it's a little bit strange, but they'll rep it for the meantime. All right. Welcome, Dale. Fantastic. And I'd just like you to talk a bit about, uh, you know, your experience at the U of M and how this created a foundation for what you do now. Outstanding. Uh, thank you very much, Kent, for this opportunity. Uh, thank you to the Department of Anthropology. Uh, really, I, a huge thanks to Dr. Robert Hoppe. Uh, Papa Hoppe, as we used to call him back in the day, taking care of all of us kids. Um, I think many of his students afterwards that were underneath his, his sort of uh, Jedi mentorship have gone on to become doctors. So I very much thanks to him. But I, I very much appreciate your call to country and acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, both past and present. Uh, I too would like to acknowledge the great First Nations groups that we find throughout the plains, including in Manitoba. Um, I'm very uh, lucky to have learned from uh, a lot of Ojibwe Cray and, and Ojibwe and Cray groups, and I, I, I'm very fortunate to, to learn from Canada's First Nations people. So thank you for all of that. 
Mm-hmm. I think that there's there's heaps to say when we're dealing with archaeology and the importance it has for uh, today's um, time and place. Uh, I've been saying a lot lately, the best thing you can do uh, in, in the present for the future is learn about the past, because it gives us a lot of ways that we can understand how people have changed in our 200,000 years as, as homo sapiens. And I, I really appreciate what Manitoba did for me, what the university did to help me with sort of anthropology in general, and then to start focusing on archaeology. One thing that's quite different between archaeology and anthropology throughout the world is how together it is, the togetherness of anthropology. So in the States, we have this traditional four-fielded system. Uh, some can, uh, Canadian universities uh, adopted this, but there's other universities like Calgary that they separate, and archaeology is not located in its anthro batch, and it's its own field, sort of a UK sort of way, and that's okay. The point here is that there's multiple ways to do anthro, and for me to become an anthropological archaeologist, I'm glad I went to Manitoba because it gave me all of the breath that I needed between linguistics, physical, cultural, and archaeology. Um, there are, there are multiple sub subfields, but I had to take a class, multiple classes in each one of those fields for my advanced degree. And as I went on through master's and PhD, classes that I thought wouldn't serve me when I were, when I, at that time, are serving me as I was older. So sometimes the information that we receive in taking these long degrees, it doesn't make sense till you're longer on that trail. And I really appreciate Manitoba's long-term vision uh, professors like, um, you know, Haskell uh, <laughs> and, and you know, uh, Professor Hoppe, Dave Stymus, David Petlin. I mean, I had a whole group of people that were, Louis Allaire. So th- this is dating a little bit, you know, but at the same time, these individuals were fundamental in my, in my growing up. So thank you to all of them as well. Yeah, no, yeah, I mean, it's absolutely fascinating. That's the interesting thing. I sometimes warn students that and they're taking a seminar with me or something, and uh, they might email me, uh, you know, the next summer or something and go, hey, you know, this this course makes a lot of sense now. And I said, gee, I'm sorry I had to wait a year for that. Uh, but it does hang around with you a little bit. And this is kind of the interesting thing. You, you, you may not realize it when you're in the middle of it, uh, it actually f- forms you later on. And I think that's a valuable part of just being an anthropologist. Even when you're in the middle of a new field situation or a new experience, um, you only realize later on how much it's actually shaped you. Well, how about this? I'll give you a point. So I took, it was anthro, I think at this time it was 202, which is culture, environment, and technology. Yeah. And that class at that time, all the gears had to take that class and they'd have to walk across the lawn and take classes with these anthro students, right? So it's like the meeting of the minds, gears and anthro, amazing. So the professor was John Luke Chokiewicz. I don't know if you remember him, great sociocultural anthropologist. Jean Luc Chokiewicz. Yeah. Man, he was just awesome. Talk about a funny man, but at the same time, when he dug in, look out, he got really serious and. This would have been 2000 or 1999. And I took that class and we had to do a paper and we read a whole bunch of material. And one of the papers that I read was Jared Diamond's 1995 piece called Easter's End. And it totally laid out the collapse hypothesis and the evidence. And now we basically um, discredit Diamond with our research as, as things go on. But he was sort of the Thor hired all of our generation showing a null hypothesis archaeologists come in to do the work and find out that empirically that data is not correct. It doesn't support your interpretive, your narrative. If it wasn't for that class and reading that paper, and then that summer between my fourth and fifth super senior year, I had, I had to take a field school, obviously, to get your advanced. And uh, I was looking at the field school, and this is when the internet was just fresh. There wasn't all of these great pages, shovel bums, and archaeology field work. And one had come from the University of Hawaii going to Easter Island. Uh, and at that time, I was, you know, with my living in Winnipeg from Chicago, trying to make this all happen. And I was one of 10 selected of that group. And multiple students that were in that field school, they all work in the Pacific now with PhDs. And some of them work for um, the old JPAC, 
which was the which is the United States Accountability uh, Service that picks up uh, dead uh, military veterans and brings them home uh, in, in excavations and forensic archaeology. So, in short, Joan Luke's class, reading Jared Diamond, field school. Now, 20 years later, uh, I've been still working on the island and and doing the research. So that's that that's sort of the 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 the, the theory. The heartfelt side comes from Dr. Robert Hoppe. So my first professional presentation was at the Canadian Association of Physical Anthropologists that was held in Winnipeg in 2001 at the Fort Gary. And Papa, I had just come back from uh, Rapa Nui and I was doing a, a field or a independent study about Hunter's brother. And I used to love to draw and Rob got me a scholarship to draw some of the first artifacts that were coming out of this heron bone that had bone arrow incised on it in the lab, gave me my space and, and let me do this project. Uh, and he said, you know what, you should present about Rapa Nui. And the first paper I ever present presented was creating successful partnerships with indigenous people, Rapa Nui style. Let me just say that again. Let me just I guess say that again. <laughs> creating successful partnerships with indigenous communities Rapa Nui style. And I went through how we work with other Rapa Nui students and how we participate in outreach education. And if from that point, I have never stopped participating with the community I work with. And if it wasn't for him saying, you need to do this, and his favorite line is, please, no text in your PowerPoint, just photos. You talk to the photos. Another great tip that he taught me. So all of these skill sets and uh, now I'm now I direct outreach programs on the island. Uh, I direct the summer program every year. I've worked with other groups that come in there. I've created my own outreach uh, agenda there. So I, I, I can't believe I can believe it. But it's like you're saying these things that we learn in our career early up sometimes come back. And I could not be more happy that I had John Luke and, and Papa Hapa in there to, to get me where I'm at today. I think that one of the most remarkable things about that is that at, at that time, there was a general sort of consensus that this was a new thing for archaeologists to kind of work with communities, uh, descendant communities. I mean, it wasn't something that was horribly thought about, although archaeologists have actually worked with sure. communities around where they were doing their work or with descendant communities, but not in an orchestrated fashion right. and, and, and not really putting enough effort into thinking about how communities and, and, and descendant communities are actually involved in the, in the work, take direction. You know, we take direction uh, from them. We learn from them. And this is always thought to be something that was very passive. And yet mm. it's something that even 20 years ago or 25 years ago, I could never understand it because I spent most of my time, even as a student, just starting out, spending my time with people who are alive in the communities that I was working in and not with dead people. Uh, the past is our subject matter, but we live in the modern world in the present day. Outstanding. Uh, and I think this is something that has now become inculcated sure. into the mainstream education of archaeologists is that it's not an option. This is in your research design. What we must it, do. It, it has to be in your research design. Yeah. On Rapa Nui, I've had so many discussions with the multiple entities to get permits. And I basically came in there one day and said, listen, if the person who's presenting a proposal that wants to do work, the first thing they should tell you is how are they giving information back? How are they building up outreach programs? How are they going to invest their time, their life, in a project? Now, on Rapa Nui, because everyone wants to study, we have sort of what I call the pollinators. They come in, they do their work, they work for a year, they do they write a book and then they disappear and never come back. And then when the Rapa Nui people want to know what's going on, they have to buy a book. There are others that are much more, um, you know, they're long-termers. They've been on the island. They've worked there for 20 years. They, I want to, I want to do that, but cross pollinating also helps as well. You know, it helps to see other cultures. It, it's, it's good. Uh, as I call it, you know, um, it's software, you know, software like these programs, 
and that you that you pick up in your brain and then the hardware allows you to organize that data that cultural context and it gives you a way better understanding and as i say in all of my stuff i know more about united states culture because i've seen other cultures yeah. and the more that you learn others the better you understand your own and it's a point i constantly make all the time and again if it wasn't for manitoba rob getting me in the program Joan Luke getting me on that 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 push to Easter Island, and those are things that I live to live for today. So I'm glad we've changed it and made it the number one issue. You work with other groups. How are you giving back? And it's not just education. I do environmental outreach, environmental concerns. I've done things like cleaning up the oceans on Rapa Nui, but using archaeological methods to document, to weigh, to quantify. To quantify. you know, I'm still using those techniques. And then I bring the kiddos out with me. And who who is going to be all of my my shovel bums? The kids. But what they end up doing is just making sand angels. You know, they don't do snow angels like in, in, Toba, in Manitoba. They make sand angels for me. And I know that they're done working for the day and we move on. <laughs> but it's good. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's long been said, you know, when you're, you're, um, when you're actively learning about someone else's culture, they're passively learning about yours. And the thing oh. is it has to be active in, or passive in both directions. That's great. And, and I think that's a wonderful thing when you, when you begin to in, engage youth, you know, in these programs, it's not, it's not obvious or anything right away. It doesn't even look like, you know, maybe anything is even really happening all that much, but right. you can't tell that in the immediate. You have to tell that over over the long term and so but there's so many ways we can communicate uh, our message our narrative give voice to other other concerns and issues and things like that and you know i mean this is one way we, we can engage communities but the audience is not large if we we mm. move those issues outside to other kinds of audiences uh, that we can engage more people i mean yeah. okay so dale you did a you did a couple TV shows and I mean, what was the kind of the idea behind those? I mean, was that, was that really to get the message out to lots of people or how did you get roped into this? Like, cause great they're word. great shows. Great <laughs> word, roped in. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> You've been thinking about this, haven't you? Yeah. Well, no, um, no, no. <laughs> no, you know what? That was, um, that was an opportunity that I, I still am working on a lot of TV stuff at the moment. Yeah. Um, I find it is a great medium to, but it's, it's, <clears throat> there's a lot of sensationalism. That's what I've constantly been battling against is, you know, how do you demystify the past? You right. know, every other show is, could it be that this is the missing remains? No, it's probably not. Don't frame it like that. Let's do a null <laughs> hypothesis and say, it's probably not this and then move on, right? That's that's proper science. That's how you actually do it. You formate your, you formulate your hypothesis. You find your data. It's sort of reversed in some of these shows. Um, I was quite happy with a lot of the 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 show in general. If we talk about the, the, the found show that was on History Channel, yeah. we did our best. We were quite scientific, but again, it's made for TV. So instead of having a full art, a full article or a book on a piece, we just did abstracts. Yeah. If you understand that analogy, so we just really didn't bite into maybe one or two artifacts, got a little more attention. But I think in season one, we did you know sixty to seventy artifacts, and it's fine. It keeps the attention span going. Three second edits, but we had a lot of critiques. Was man, I wish you would just take the whole episode and talk about that or. So again, we, you, you deal with that. The more professional things that we did through What on Earth, and that, that's, I, I find that a little more scientific. They, they did a little better of a job. They are using remote sensing, which is a technique we use in archaeology quite frequently. Uh, and I, the, the newest one, though, it's the cool, is a French company. One, just really quick, I know our time-wise, and we said, but there's a big difference when you film with, for example, European companies and United States companies. And it reminds me a little bit of our archaeology because in Found, which was done by a company called Committee Films out of Minnesota, we had 30 people working. And each person is specialized and has their spot. You have a showrunner, you have three producers, you have all this stuff. When you work with the European, it's usually skeleton crews of two people talent and then a producer who's producer director showrunner and then camera sound you know grip all of that thing in one so archaeology sort of like that too we're sort of specialist you know we have 50 people 
but back in the day, you were an archaeologist and you did everything, right? Yeah. Frank Boas published something like 400 papers in his career in all four subfields of his time. He didn't focus just on one, and then he uses that synthesis of the four fields to come across with things like cultural relativism and all of his his big breakthroughs, and then all the Boazians underneath him, Mead and Benedict and um, – you know, A.B. Lewis, all these individuals that come from his sort of thinking. But my point here is archaeology has become much more like U.S. filming. So many specializations, you, you know, sometimes it's so many micro points, it's hard to get to the macro. But because you have all this specialization, it looks for it, it looks a little different. The, the, the Europeans with just two per people, they know a lot of stuff. All of those guys and, and ladies, they can do a lot of it. Um, and that's what anthropology used to be like, where you were more of a, a, a generalist. Now everyone seems to be a specialist. So one of my jo- my goals has been is to really become more of a generalist again and understand all of those subfields and really create bridges between the hard sciences and the soft sciences. That's something we have discussed. You know, I'm sure I'm using this archaeological chemistry for a lot of my research, but at the same time, I've got to link that into social science theory especially political economy theory and that gives me an interpretive bridge between these topics and then we've got in we, and then it's not really a bridge it's a three-way bridge then we've got to bring in the indigenous voice because yeah. they, you know that, that that's that's it's, it's eticonomic you know you got to bring yeah. the scientific but you also need to bring that local view together and i think that's what manitoba taught me to do very very well yeah you know what i think that's a, a remarkable thing because it's also it, it it's important for students to understand that at any any given point in a career, if you choose a career in this, there is going to be a long time where you are required to be that specialist, right? You have to learn these really technical things. You got to be really kind of an expert in one thing. But as you move through your career, the more years you put in, the more time you think you actually move back to the position of being a generalist. And that's when you actually feel comfortable being in charge of running a large team of people. Because you've learned, enough, even though you may have a specialism in maybe one or two things, you've learned enough about all the others and how they fit together, yet you're then comfortable carrying on a conversation with all of these other specialists because you know what they're doing and why they're doing it and how it fits together. But you're the one who can now go okay, all of you, this is our mission. <laughs> and the, everyone in the community, okay, tell us those things that need to be part of your mission. And, and but the, it takes time to get there. And it's this, it's this long kind of trajectory. Yes. And, it's, you know, and students don't realize it's like, you, this is a, it, it's not just a career. It's actually just your, your life. It's what you do with your life. And you know, if you don't want to do that for a career or a life, you're going to take something away from it that's going to make you uniquely positioned to understand the world differently. I have to tell you that the found uh, the show was good, the inspiration for one of the um, assignments I do in in in, in a seminar, okay. and I have students because it's a lot like a, a life history or a biography approach to objects, and I have each of them kind of write a biography of an object that I don't care what it is. It could be a car or a a brush or a a toothpick or whatever, but they have to write the history of the object. And then they have to look at the broader social significance of that object, how it fits into a society. So for me, that was the great fun of that show, but how it can also be something that a, a student, even though they're getting your abstract of it, they will now look at that show, having done that assignment and go, okay, hold on. I got a hundred questions about this. Why didn't they talk about that? Why didn't they ask that? You know, and that is the seeking mind. That is the inquiring kind of, you know. Oh, and trust me, they they all find me. They all find me. (laughs) I have days of of questions. Sometimes I can give answers. And sometimes, as you know, we can't. But we can give hypothesis. We can give background data. We could we can think about those. Yeah, I love doing artifact life histories. I'm a big, um, you know, uh, object biography guy in a lot of my stuff. But I specifically say you can't do things from found. <laughs> because, <No. laughs> uh, I, I just say you could watch it for inspiration. But I don't want any objects from my own show. You know? <laughs> Find your own thing. Come on, do your own thing. But, 
<laughs> most, 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 I get, I get some things back. Oh, I saw you on TV. That's great work. Now I got a better understanding of archaeology. And then they actually do the class and they're like, wow, you know, it's much more specialized than I thought. I, I wanted to say this just really quick. I mean, we have the, the best STEAM field, not STEM, STEAM, right? Science, technology, engineering, art, math. Archaeology, my, my argument is, and I'd love to write a paper about this, that, and I'm sure it's already been discussed. It's not like I'm, an, I'm something new here, but I argue that archaeology, and we can maybe just say anthropological archaeology, is the greatest STEAM field in the world. It, without a doubt, it gives everything that many other fields don't do. So I really would like to create, you know, a class called Archaeology as STEAM or STEAM Archaeology. I don't know. But to me, that's the future because not only are we giving them the background of the people and cultures of the past, but we're giving them technologies to use, as you're saying, for your life. To You know, like we're, we're dealing with media at the moment and understanding and trying to interpret media. The first thing that comes to my mind, what's the source? What's what's the reference? You know, that that's the most basic academic thing that should always pop in your mind if something comes to your to your feed. All right, what's the academic source on? Who's publishing that? Is there a counter publication? Okay, let me let me understand that. And then as you get more advanced, you start thinking, what's the sample size here? What's the rate of error? Where's calibrations? Who's done other studies that support or deny? You know, these things are crucial for life. I don't need to I don't need to think about things about cultures. I do that for day to day when I'm dealing with people in my life, with media, with news, with opportunities. So sort of this steam mentality has sort of permeated into my entire life. And I think science is life, man. Science is the way to go. Uh, and it, it gives me um, you know confidence that the more people we have steaming out there, the hotter it's going to be. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's, you know, uh, I, what a great analogy we want we want uh, global warming because of steam now you know we want it but we want an intellectually hotter place not physically although you know uh, it is a on, let me winter right now because this article's writing itself here let's just sort of <laughs> make that little note right there because that thing's cold thank you <laughs> Noted. <laughs> you know i mean I, th th those are the special things i think about about university it's it it comes down to you know it whenever you go to university you don't you don't necessarily go to the university it ends up becoming those people that you remember later on in your life that had an impact on you and you didn't even necessarily know it was impacting you at the time um i've i've always kind of wondered it's like the classes that i enjoyed the most i actually said the least i think hmm. and looked like i was a, a deer caught in the headlights most of the time and and that you know now as someone who's been teaching for quite a while i see those looks and i go oh maybe i'm doing my job or everyone is truly confused i don't know and and, and those are the kinds of things that i think that we draw back on and um you know i'm a very proud of uh, of what you've done I'm, I'm very proud that you actually have that feeling that extends back to your undergraduate days that you felt like this was foundational and pivotal and pushed you I mean it, it has interesting it, it, it absolutely has and I, I think that you make me feel great thank you for acknowledging that I think that's one thing we do need in this world instead of sort of academic put downs or academic push-ups so I really appreciate that. And it, it makes sense. It's coming from Manitoba. Yeah. Right? It just, it just, this, you're an extension of this, this, this mind frame, this mentality. So I very much, I thank you. I thank you for that and as well. I think some of your projects are outstanding. I wish we could have another little chat and go into all of your, you know, ethno archeology span and experimental archeology. span Like you're, you're on some top tier stuff. And especially I was really impressed with you bringing students in from other areas of the world. Um, yeah. You know, especially from your African project, where I'm sure you told them to come to Manitoba in the summertime. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> and then you didn't say visit in the winter. Let's make sure you <laughs> like it. And then you go into semester. <laughs> well, there's a, you got enough time to acclimatize. Otherwise, it's just. Ah, so sure. we'll I see mean, how I'll, that goes. Let me write that one down. <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe I'll do a talk for the colloquium and then you can talk with me and sure. we'll just flip. We'll just flip roles. I think it'd be great. It'd be great. <laughs> well, you know, one thing, the last thing I wanted to get into just mm. was just talk a little bit about what I'm going to be doing for the lecture. You know, we have yeah, dialed in a little bit about Rapa Nui. Um, so just, just really quickly, 
um, I took that field school after John Luke's class. I, I took the field school to Rapa Nui through the University of Hawaii. That was led by Dr. Terry Hunt, who's now the dean at uh, University of Arizona. Mm-hmm. Um, he was at Hawaii for many years and then went to Oregon and now in Arizona because Terry likes the warm weather. He doesn't. <laughs> um, you know, and um, I just recently completed my PhD in November. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy. It, it, it was the most scary and rewarding experience of my life. Uh, and I know that it made me my mental toughness. Uh, I'm thinking about, you know, this pandemic and shutdowns we're in. And I'm thinking, I was already doing that. I was, <laughs> I was already locked down in front of the computer screen. So I don't, think, I don't think much has changed. The only thing that has changed is being able to go to our sites and whatnot. So I had gone to the island after November to to film with a few companies and to do my program in January because it's their summertime down there. Uh, and then obviously Corona hit. And after March 20th of this year, no more planes left the island oh. so from April, May, June, July, August. There were no planes and I was living the ultimate dream. I mean, <laughs> I just went out in the field every day. It was it was I was fishing and checking out sites and I actually found new sites that I hadn't registered during my PhD because they were located on cliffs that I just didn't have time to go to and I've been documenting those so my my 20 year period there on Rapa Nui is one thing I want to talk about um, how it starts at Manitoba and it gets me here till today and that will highlight a whole bunch of different type of archaeology because as although I think your point was right on, you learn a whole bunch of specialties as you go on. So for my undergrad, I was much more focused on sort of culture history and osteology. And then for my master's, I got into landscape archaeology and GIS. And then for my PhD, I really started to focus on geochemistry, uh, political economy theory. So I, you know, they're like little patches that you pick up along the way, you know, and then once you have all the patches, it converts into the PhD patch. So I, I really want to highlight that process. I want to highlight the process of, of, of creating bridges between local groups and scientists, soft science and hard science. Um, uh, and then I really want to touch it up by saying how much uh, Manitoba really motivated me to become a full anthropologist. So thank you very much to the department. Thank you for hosting this, this interview. Um, I look forward to the chat this Friday. Um, please come with questions. Anything you want to know about Easter Island and the large statues, I will be happy to answer them. So thanks again, uh, Kent. This was so fun. Thanks. Oh, thanks a lot, Dale. Absolute pleasure. This is great to have you. This is going to be such a fun talk. Everyone, tune in 27th. What are we doing? Two o'clock or is it 2.30? You know, 2:30. I'll show up at two. If we want some free questions, just screwing around on the, on the, on the chat. I got no problem with that, yeah. but... 2 30 will be the the official start time i'm hoping for an hour 15 maybe an hour and 30 just to stretch it out if we can uh, i know people have time concerns and then leave 15 minutes for questions that's how I, I i'd like to run it but if i get the time i can talk for days about the island so i, I don't want to do that to you <laughs> okay all right thanks a lot dill fantastic all right Take care, boss. Take cheers care. okay bye now <laughs>